it, it's a pleasure that you all have come. Uh, we have been discussing with uh, Monsieur Nantam for quite some time now, but it is, as you know, it's very difficult to have his time. And we are very happy and honored that he could come and speak in an informal way to our global English students and the students who are from the international exchange programs and also some of the international students who are here. When we discussed with uh, Mr. Nanta, uh, we came up with a topic which is uh, very, uh, let's say, very diffused and uh, very open-ended, which is um, how about being the French CEO in an American company? And it's an open topic, so you can discuss. Uh, and it's a very informal way of discussion. And <coughs> Mr. Nantam has been 29 years in the same company. He would, of course, talk about trajectory, trajectory and the growth of the company, globalization, and complexity of managing such a global corporation. It is not that since I teach you about global corporation that this is the topic, but it was mm. <laughs> discussed like this. What is interesting is uh, Mr. Antam has um, two offices, which means that Paris office and the Chicago office, and usually it is coordinated in such a way that um, he maintains his contacts throughout the world when he takes up this position. So I won't uh, speak uh, much hmm. more, and I give you the mic so that we can discuss for the next one hour whatever you want to wish and discuss with our students. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. It's just uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you this uh, this evening and that the the opportunity to have more dialogue and a conversation i mean that uh, group is uh, small enough so uh, we can make uh, we can make this extremely extremely interactive of course i'm uh, even more pleased to be here being uh, 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 ESSEC alumni graduated in 80, in 81 and uh, probably the three years uh, between 78 and 80 and 81 were probably the best uh, years uh, I, I could remember. But uh, for, for all sorts of reasons, I will probably not share all of them with you. Uh, but it was happy days, so to speak, and uh, probably extremely happy days because that was the right age, the right opening to the world. Uh, I, you know, I was from Lyon, so that was for me as well the opportunity to move to, <laughs> not so much to Paris, because at that time, believe me, uh, Sergi was very uh, special in the early days, very early days, <laughs> very, very early days. So uh, we were quite uh, pioneering the new, uh, uh, the new format uh, moving from, uh, from Paris uh, to, to Sergi, and uh, that was just, uh, just great and a, and a huge development uh, uh, for me, as well as the unique spirit of, the, of that school. As you know, at the ESSEC, we always claim to be different, uh, to claim on our differentiation, with a kind of uh, very open-minded, uh, 180 degree open to the world, uh, very international, very different. Uh, and probably uh, uh, we, we always claim that uh, people graduated from ESSEC are uh, more aware of what's happening in the world. And uh, that's why it was uh, uh, fascinating for me to to graduate from the from the school, and uh, I'm still extremely pleased. I'm following what's happening with our school, and I hope we'll continue to uh, to compete to lead uh, against our uh, favorite uh, competitors we never name. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it has not changed. We can't even mention the name of the main competitor. Uh, so that that's what that is. Extremely pleased to talk about. Uh, uh, what it takes to be the CEO, I mean, frankly, uh, uh, I don't think there is any difference being French or, or non-French or whatever, so I will probably articulate some of my uh, thinking around uh, what it takes to lead a, a, a global company of some size. And just to uh, frame for you for, for what Accenture is all about, because it might not be uh, maybe well known for uh, many of you, uh, Accenture is a company operating in professional services uh, from uh, management consulting to uh, uh, technology and uh, uh, outsourcing. So it's all, it's more techy in terms of center of gravity uh, from the consulting to outsourcing. And we are uh, covering all that spectrum, uh, operating in 17 different industries, banking, insurance, consumer package, energy, utilities, transportation, public sector, health, uh, 
uh, you name it, we're covering all the different uh, companies and we're operating, we have offices in 54 countries around the world, but operating in more than 100 countries. So that's the kind for the, for the reach of the company. Now, as I mentioned, we have some size and that's probably where I will uh, articulate what it takes to lead a uh, giant. Uh, $26 billion revenues, uh, growing last year 15% in local currency. So figure that out in a world which is growing in the range of 4%, 15%. Uh, uh, so we're growing multiple times the GDP growth. So there are ways of, 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 doing, of doing this. Uh, more than now a $44, $45 billion market cap. Uh, we're quite a young company, uh, just 10 years old as a li listed company, just a, a teenager, early teen. Uh, we uh, went public IPO uh, in uh, 01, I think the 111, one, one, one. so uh, 010101, so it's easy to remember uh, when we went public, so uh, just a 10 years IPO. Uh, and we move from zero at the IPO to a $42, $43 billion company now, just for you to figure out we are about the same market cap as an HP, Hewlett Packard. That, that to, to frame what, what, what that is just uh, over 10 years. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it, of course, it is changing uh, every day, but we have 250 or 260,000 people around the world. So it's big, according to uh, uh, any standards. Uh, 250,000, including uh, half of it, 150,000 people would be in new emerging markets. A significant part would be in India, 70,000 people in India, close to 20,000 people in the Philippines, just to give you some of the big numbers. Uh, we are shy of 10,000 people in Brazil. Uh, six to 7,000 people in China, just to mention some of the big uh, new markets uh, where, we have, uh, where we have our people. In and, Africa too? And in Africa as well. Uh, no, 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 no. South Africa South is our largest, uh, uh, largest operations. Uh, uh, in all Africa, uh, we are in the range of the uh, uh, $700 million revenues in Africa. So we we, we big. So we have a significant footprint, of course, in all the different continents. Our roots are close to Chicago. In the time, uh, you probably remember the Arthur Andersen days. So I joined uh, Arthur Andersen in uh, 83. Uh, so rapidly after I graduated the school and did my military service. Uh, uh, and uh, our center of gravity definitely was Chicago, US. Uh, then the firm moved from the U.S. to Europe, and now we are on this journey given the dramatic uh, change in the uh, uh, overall geopolitical economic environment we will have the opportunity to discuss. Uh, we continue our move from uh, west to east and north to south. And, and it's, a, it's a very dramatic agenda we are, we are driving uh, today. Just as a data point, in the U.S. as we speak, we have 30,000 people. So on 250, say only 30,000 left uh, in the U.S. Uh, we are incorporated in Ireland, so we are not an American company. We are not a French company. We are an Irish company, so we are a European company. Uh, and uh, in Europe, we have uh, more than 60,000 people. So Europe, uh, from a business standpoint, would be the center of gravity. Not from a people standpoint, but from a business standpoint, we are truly European. Uh, and uh, so we are listed in the New York Stock Exchange, incorporating in uh, Dublin, the CEO is French, and we have most of our resources in India, China, Brazil, Philippines, and elsewhere. So that, this is probably what I would describe as a truly global company. And we are even, I would say, we would probably qualify it as the single most truly global uh, company of our size in the world because we do not have any headquarters. So there is nothing like a physical place where you will have the leadership in most of the organization. Uh, you will have the place where you have the leadership. It's true for Microsoft. It's good for all the companies in the world. As far as I know, there is only one in the world, only one of our size without any headquarters in the world. 
and that company is Accenture. So we're working only on a virtual basis. That's why I'm mentioning that listed in Dublin, uh, listed in New York, incorporated in Dublin. Uh, I'm physically in Paris when I, you know, my family is in Paris. So I've got a CEO corner, if you will, uh, in, the, uh, in the Paris offices. So there is a president for our Paris operation. So I'm uh, the guest of my, of my friend. There is only me. Uh, here, and uh, if you take the 20 members of our global management committee, all the 20 members uh, are living in 20 cities. And we are gathering and having all our meetings on a virtual basis, leveraging technology, uh, telepresence, webcast, uh, whatever. So only with the iPad or iPhone, uh, we can have uh, a meeting with the, G with the leadership team whenever we want, wherever we are. I can even have a, one here with you. Uh, that would be uh, good fun. But it's, uh, first, it's an illustration on how you can manage a giant in a way which is extraordinarily flexible and nimble, which is probably part of uh, the thing you've been discussing. Uh, as well as being truly global. I don't believe you could be truly global if you have a quarter in the US or even if you have all, all your leaders in a single place. And even if your leaders uh, are from different countries, if you live and if you work in the same place, I don't think you could claim to have the global awareness uh, you mean. So uh, when I was appointed uh, uh, 18 months ago as the CEO, the first request from the board was don't move. You might think that people probably, the first question would have been, yeah, you should move to New York because this is where you have the investors. You should move to whatever, sh Shanghai, because this is the new world. You should move to Mumbai because we have 70,000 people. I, I, I would have you know, 10, 20 good reasons to be in some, in some place in the world uh, from a business, geo, uh, political standpoint or whatever. I said, no, no, don't move. Uh, we, we are not moving the people, we're moving the ideas. And that, that, that's what we do. And I think that's very profound and it's really creating uh, something very different with Accenture. Uh, that's why sometimes when I you know, uh, ask the question, when I'm participating to a CEO forum or whatever, say, where are you from? Where are you located? Uh, yeah, I'm personally located in, uh, in Paris, but I have uh, uh, the other CEO corner, if you will, where we're in Paris, one in New York and one in Boston. So that's the kind, and uh, I will open uh, uh, another one in Shanghai. I mean, the CEO corner is just an office of uh, 20 square meters. I mean, don't dream about anything fancy. Uh, the only point is there is a special security. So I'm the only one to who could enter the office. That's the, on, that, that's the only privilege of the CEO for security reasons. So uh, you have three around the world and, and, and that's it. Um, so that, that's for the company. Maybe a few, few words, and again, I, I would like to get, I uh, receive many questions from you about uh, uh, probably what it takes to be a CEO. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't, I don't think uh, French or whatever, the nationality is playing any role uh, in, in leading the company. It's more the attributes uh, which are meaningful. Uh, and I think to, I mean, to be a global leader, uh, they are quite clear. But let's start maybe with the beginning is what's new uh, in the world of the leadership or in, in leading uh, organization in the new world? Uh, probably for, I mean, for years, I don't remember starting uh, economics uh, uh, 29 years ago, 30 years ago at the, at the ESSEC, and every time you claim the world is different by construction. It's part of the job of professors, me. You know, there is always something different happening in the world, and it's true that management been through a series of revolution, evolution, and so forth. And at some point of time, all that bullshit is true. <laughs> so sometimes you try to invent change, you try to to invent transformation to make the case. And, and you never know whether it's a small transformation, it's a big transformation, it's a medium transformation. Here, and probably we, we will know, uh, or people writing history books will know in 50 years from now, that indeed something happened between uh, 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, five years, and we are not done with this. Uh, uh, and when the world been going through 
a massive uh, business revolution. Uh, probably we didn't been through for decades. And, and we have facts uh, for, for that now uh, from a demographic. I mean, you know all of this. I will not get you all, through all, all of this. But uh, when some uh, data points are, are, are really telling, I mean, probably the most interesting, because it's the most robust in terms of uh, data, is demography, because the rest uh, is, is around economic and social science. Uh, which are more interpretation of facts or you're trying to predict the future. But demography is extraordinarily uh, clear. I mean, you have 7 uh, uh, billion people on the planet, uh, one in US Europe, billion. That's it. I mean, from that, you, you can absolutely derive all the rest uh, because the economy and all the rest will follow the population because uh, at the end of the day, the uh, engines for economic growth, from what I remember from 30 years, things might have changed, but uh, uh, just for the anecdote at the time, uh, the, the, the big guys at DSEC were the monetarists. Uh, the Florin Talion, Frédéric Jenny, are still, oh, still there. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, Frédéric Jenny with long hair. Yes. Now he's it's, it's more, uh, you know, he, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the last time he was working with OECD and he was very well. Uh, I remember, well, 30 years ago, he was just back from his PhD in Harvard. He was only speaking in English. Uh, he was the only one. Because, you know, 30 years ago, nobody spoke English except Fred. And so he delivered all his uh, ma microeconomy thing. Uh, and he was the kind of the, the superstar with uh, Ponce, Jenny, and uh, at Aftalion. So those are my masters. Okay. So I, I stopped in 81 all what I learned from economy. And, and I'm trying now to leverage uh, that knowledge around uh, Friedman and the Chicago School and all that thing, uh, which you know, is still ver very, uh, uh, very valid. But when you, when you look at this, so we know where the population will, is, and will be. Uh, uh, we know how things are growing. We know the middle class uh, rise. You know, you know all of this. And if you believe that today we are not short on capital, I'm not talking about France, but for the, the rest of the world is not short of capital. So it's really accessible. So there is no limit to what you could invest. And you have access to capital. You have access to technology. You have access to knowledge. And if you combine knowledge, uh, technology, and innovation, uh, capital and talented labor, there should be a good environment. All of this is available on the planet. Now, it's more available in some part of the world than the other part of the world, and especially, uh, uh, you know, the Europe market are today short of innovation for all sorts of reasons. They're short of talent. They do not graduate anymore. The enough scientists, I mean, 500,000 people graduate from science in India which is much more than all Europe altogether. I mean, you know all of this. So wh when you look at this uh, and, and the r shift from uh, west to east and north to south, it's not only a shift, it's the speed of the ship, which is just fascinating. And it's the speed of the acceptance of new technology, which is as well fascinating. So of course, you can plan that you know, China will be big. The point is not about China being big, it's China is being big now and in getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster. So there is a kind of uh, exponential uh, evolution and shift in the world, which is just fascinating. And I remember with uh, Accenture we had, we defined two years ago our strategy for the cloud, the famous cloud computing. And we said, OK, what's the cloud going to be in you know, 10 years from now? We got it wrong by 10 years. Shouldn't have been 10 years, should have been 10 months. That, that, that's the kind of shift we see, including us. And we're in the high tech, we're in the short cycle. We claim to be on top of our game, <laughs> uh, to have our sensors everywhere around the world. And we, we're still impacted and amazed by the speed of change, which is happening as we speak. Uh, and so it, it has profound implication, of course, on the on the management. So the world is changing at a pace which is just incredible. Uh, and uh, 
as a CEO of a company, you need to cope with that. And to paraphrase Bob McDonald, who's the CEO, who is the CEO of P&G, and is very famous in the leadership world uh, for his vision, uh, he declared that the world is uh, VUCA, V-U-C-A, VUCA. So, and that's going to be now the, the, the world in which you have to operate. Volatility, I mean, you see that as a CEO, you need to be at ease when your stock price is moving 10%, dropping 20%, moving 10 again. Say, okay, I mean, that's normal. So volatility is normal, probably. Uh, years ago, we just have been scared, say, what's happening? And, and now you need to live in a world where volatility of everything is part of the game, and, and you need to integrate that. You for uncertainty. I mean, the world is uncertain. I mean, no need to explain that further. Uh, not even coming to the black swine or whatever, but yeah. Uh, there is more and more those kind of events you can't predict, of course, and you need to, 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 live, uh, to live with. Uh, probably today we move to some massive uncertainty in what's going to happen in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Arab environment. This, this is probably as we, you know, uh, the uncertainty was around the collapse of the, uh, the financial market. Then you move to the collapse of the euro based on the surrender debt, and now probably the big black swan will be what's going to happen in Iran, in that part of the world which could totally uh, uh, change, change the game. Uh, not mentioning the other catastrophes, such as what happened with nuclear in Japan. And suddenly the, your world is totally different. So it's highly uncertain. C for complexity, which is another interesting ingredient you need uh, to live in a world when you're at ease dealing with complex things. Because the world is big, the world is extraordinarily complex. When you're mentioning you're operating in, under, in uh, more than 100 countries, you need to get it. Uh, and as we used to say, uh, people living in China are not French-speaking Chinese. They are Chinese. <laughs> so they are, they are different. All the people are not American speaking Chinese, speaking Indian. So we know that there is not anymore one model, and there are multiple models in multiple continents, and, in, and the world is truly multipolar, and the globalization is not anymore the model from the West uh, exported to the East. We know the role. No, you need to reinvent the role, and it, it's adding a lot of complexity uh, in what you do. Uh, and uh, A for ambiguity. There is, no black, there is no simple answer to almost nothing, and you need to live in the gray world where there is nothing like a yes, no, black and white uh, kind of thing, uh, and simple rules to apply, and, and you will get the results. So that's the kind of environment a CEO uh, has got to live, to, to live with, which on one hand is extraordinarily exciting, uh, in the sense that there is no clear answer and probably the management and the leadership has to be reinvented. We left the management with uh, Jack Welch and, and GE, so we had the rules. I mean, you can throw that uh, away through the window uh, and say, okay, what else? <laughs> what else? Because it doesn't work uh, anymore. So it's interesting to that sense, and especially for the future leaders like you uh, uh, in, in leading that new world. And of course, it's scary. Uh, because it's always good to refer to something, to open a book and say, okay, uh, what the kind of one, two, three, four I need to do to get it right. And when you say, wait, well, uh, you know, it doesn't work anymore, what, what, what do I do? Uh, so uh, that's why many CEOs I'm, I'm uh, meeting with, I mean, we have long discussions around, I mean, what do you do? So, well, you know, uh, uh, how do you planning your geo expansion? So, so, I don't know, I'm trying things. And we are more and more in a world where you're trying more than, you know, you have strong belief and uh, I, I, I know what I'm doing. No, I know what I'm betting on and then uh, I will express my judgment. So uh, uh, it's exciting from a leadership standpoint. And I'm using leadership because I think from, from my perspective, there is a very strong difference between leading and managing. And that difference is becoming more and more important. And for years, probably you would have been able to run a company like Accenture being a good manager. Now, if, if you're a good manager, you can't run a company. You can manage a piece of it, 
but you can't you you you, you can't really uh, drive uh, and and lead. So you know, if if I would make just very simply uh, some of the dif differences, and I'm sure you you talked already about it. I mean, the leader is someone going to drive. The manager is someone going to run something, which of course is very different. Uh, the leader will will inspire when the manager will deliver. And so uh, running a business and delivering results is what the manager is going to do. You play by the rule, and so you're running by the rule, and you're delivering by the rule. And if you're a good manager, you're delivering good results, and life is good. Uh, uh, leadership is very different. It's starting by uh, inspiring, mobilizing, creating the vision, and then by driving, and driving in this VUCA environment. And then you have many other people who are going to manage for you the peace of the organization. But the role of the CEO is indeed to be careful not to be the one who's going to manage, uh, but someone who, who's going to lead. And which is not very, uh, I mean, simple because you know, probably in my 29 years with Accenture, for 26, 25 years, I've been more running. But so what you're learning is to run. So you know how to, I mean, to manage the, to do a strategic planning, to do uh, to look at the accounting. You're learning the uh, uh, all the accounting things and uh, and, and all the disciplines uh, you, you've been learning at school. And suddenly, when you're the CEO, the managers are looking at you to lead, not to do their job, because they know how to manage very well. Especially in companies like ours, they're all superb, very good. And they're asking questions, say, where do we go? Which has nothing to do with managing. Are we going to get there? Uh, how do you see Accenture in uh, 10 years from now? That has nothing to do with management. That everything to do with vis visioning, uh, then driving, say, OK, we're going to get there. To get there, we're going to do this, that. There are going to be uh, bumps on the road. Uh, and then you need to communicate and inspire the people and mobilize the managers. And, and, uh, and, and so that, that's, uh, that, that is interesting. Uh, if you look at uh, facing the VUCA, we put the four things which are uh, important to get right. I mean, the first one is, of course, the strategy. Let's start with that. You've been through probably all sorts of strategic courses and you know everything about strategy. Uh, when the world is so volatile, I think the, the strategic exercise has be, is becoming very different. Uh, and it's not so much the kind of, uh, you know, you're planning and you're doing the whole thing. I used to say that the strategic planning, uh, the strategy now is more a marathon uh, you're, uh, as a series of sprint. So it's still a marathon because you need to have a view potentially for the going eight years, and then you, you, you need to, to have your series of sprints, so you're moving from one place to another, and then you reassess where you are. So it's like, uh, you know, you want to get to the moon, but then you need to manage your trajectory, and, and, and maybe even the moon, maybe at the north, but you're going to start by the south because you have the good reason, and then you reassess. So that's, that's this kind of permanent uh, reassessment, which is extraordinarily uh, important. Of course, you have a rolling plan, so for us, uh, we've defined our ambition for 2020. So we've defined what it is we want to be in 2020. So we have a vision of uh, what it is. And then we have a kind of three years rolling plan. We are reassessing every year to correct, uh, to correct the trajectory. And, uh, and more than before, scenario planning, or what we are calling now even stress testing, is part of the strategic exercise. So. Uh, for us, it's almost every quarter we are stress testing, like the banks, uh, our hypothesis. So the kind of what if, which has always been part of the strategy scenario planning, now is becoming critical uh, uh, given the volatility of the parameters. So what if Europe is, collect is collapsing? Uh, what if uh, China is not taking up at the pace uh, we would like? What if the pricing pressure are more than what we expect? What if the turnover of our people is, is more important than we expect in India, which is where we are doing most of our recording. So we are permanently stress testing our hypothesis to reconfirm our trajectory uh, or to correct. The other point which is uh, important is how you manage, uh, how you, not you manage, how you shape your organization. 
uh, and most of the time, you know, organization design, you're doing that, and probably for 10 years, uh, you leave as it is. Uh, I mean, the keywords from an organization uh, strategy standpoint are now nimble, agile, flexible, all that kind of thing. Now, how you translate <laughs> agile flexibility being in the real world of an organization when you have uh, 50 offices around the world and 250,000 people. You know, to be nimble, flexible, and agile is, is a huge challenge. So clearly, uh, organization should be flat. At least this is what we put in place, even when you're big. And uh, I mean, it, uh, all the uh, Global Management Committee members are reporting to me, 20. Probably a few years ago, you would have put a COO, a CEO, put a couple of a hierarchy in between, Say now, wait a minute, we're so big, I need to, uh, to have some, at least two or three or four levels just to manage the size of the beast. And uh, it doesn't work. Because it, what, what you need is a level of feedback, which is permanent. So the point is not so much, of course, you need to delegate, I will come back to this, but you need, I mean, everything is speed to, speed to consumer speed to decision, speed to feedback, speed to reassess. That's the kind of uh, whatever the, your size is. And you can run a company of 10 people, of 250,000 people, is the same thing. You need that speed to everything. So uh, it's much better to be flat. You know, in Accenture, we have two levels, three with me. <laughs> but that's what that is. And imagine the size we have. Yeah, so uh, if, uh, so I have got my, uh, uh, I mean, the 20 reports will be the global, the truly global roles. Uh, and then people will be in the GUs. So you have the global and the GUs. And uh, in, in, in our organization, probably people would say we divided the world in, in three big regions. The classic, Americas, EMEI, and Asia Pacific. It's all in the books. Jack Welch, as this, yeah, 1850, <laughs> he decided the world will be organized in three regions because that's the way you operated 50 years ago. We divided the world in 17 geographic units. And if we need 20, we will have 20. I don't think that's an issue. So the, the issue is not so much the number of direct reports, uh, uh, the number of GUs, it's, it's all about the discipline you're going to put in place, and you need strong discipline. Technology is helping a lot, and the quality of the management. And, and then I, I welcome on the philosophy, uh, what it takes. So uh, probably there is a, another change, which is when you're big, you need to structure. But when you're starting to create layers, bureaucracy, and it's a disaster. So you need to de-layer the organization, probably what we're spending most of our time in, in simplification. Every day we train complexity to simplify. And you know now in the world of the business, the champion for simplification when it comes to, when it comes to product. Because one being the super champion master of making the complex simple, Steve Jobs with Apple. That is the definition of how you creating massive simplicity from massive complexity. So we're all trying to do with our own organization what Apple been able to do uh, with their device. And, uh, and that was on purpose to simplify. So that's, uh, uh, so flat, simplification is key. So tra tra tracking everything which is redundant. And, and even if you're creating gaps, sometimes it's better than creating bureaucracy. Decentralization is key. So you can have only uh, 20 direct report plus you multiply by 15 thing if you have clear delegation of authority and decentralization. So, uh, I mean, the, the world of centralization is gone, which is a huge change for American based company like Accenture, where you have a huge tradition of centralization, standardization. I mean, again, the same thing. Centralization, standardization, 
global contingency, all that kind of thing. They are still valid in principles, but you need to be very careful in the way you execute. So you can, you know, you can be highly decentralized and you need to be highly standardized. So one is coming with the other. Simplification is coming with standardization. So that, that's the kind of thing that are important. And of course, the clarity of objective. If you want to decentralize, you need to define extraordinary clear objective. Probably not a big uh, you know, us. I know I've probably measured on 40 objectives or that kind of thing, because we love that kind of bureaucracy, where four matters at the end of the day for the board. So but, no, that's, that's what that is. Three, I would say the, uh, the philosophy, the kind of company philosophy, the thing you believe in. Uh, as you're getting bigger, more and more decentralized, uh, with more and more geographies, and, and you're leading a world which is more and more different, uh, what is remaining you know, common to the old thing? And this is where you're getting to the uh, principles and values. Because this is where you, you're recreating I mean, what we're calling uh, the accenture way, your way of doing things. That might be the one HSBC or uh, whatever. Uh, what we're calling in our jargon the glue, the secret sauce, which, which is what are we calling the kind of culture, principle, values, which are keeping the, the whole thing together, despite I mean, the size. Just imagine in Accenture, uh, in five years from now, so we are 250,000 people as we speak, in five years from now, we will have to recruit 300,000 people. And with the turnover, we will lose 230,000 people, which means in five years from now, we will have to recreate Accenture from scratch. So you have a couple of dinosaurs like me. But, you know, so I'm, I'm you know, maybe I've got the sauce from Chicago, from, but <laughs> we have less and less people who could, you know, describe this sauce from the partnership and so forth. Now, given our growth, our turnover, and just the size, uh, we have 5,000 partners, senior executive. Uh, two thirds have been with us for less than 10 years. So they, they didn't know the partnership. They didn't know Arthur Anderson. They didn't know Anderson Consulting. They, they don't know our roots, Chicago and all that kind of thing. So they know us now. So working very hard on the values and on your principles is, is extremely important. Uh, you need to have extraordinary clear business principles. So the way you operate should be extremely clear and simple. I'm putting there, I mean, your business model should be very clear. What's your business? What's your portfolio? What's not? That's what that is. And here, uh, the kind of G thing is still valid. If you want to compete, you need to be in the top three. How you manage your portfolio. So all of this is remaining. You need to be extraordinarily clear because if everybody's starting to do their hobby in terms of you know, in India, we like to do this. In China, no, 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 it's different. It's a bloody mess. So you need to be extraordinarily clear to, we are in Accenture, seven kind of businesses. Management consulting, technology consulting, infrastructure outsourcing, system integration, blah, 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 application outsourcing, BP. Period, end of story. And if you're opening a number eight, we will tell you. <laughs> and, and this is where you need the this. This. You need to be extremely clear on your diversification. If we've been able to grow even during the crisis by three, four times the GDP growth was because we had diversification in our model. And the diversification is the type of business, the type of industries. Uh, so 17 industries, seven different businesses, 15 geographic units. You imagine the level of diversification. And today we're moving at, uh, we're growing our emerging market uh, twice the average rate, growth rate of Accenture. So that's, uh, yeah, if someone's got a question, I mean, uh, why are we growing China? No, we are growing China. It's not, so there are things which are not for discussion and we make our bet. And someone said, yeah, but I would like to open uh, Colombia. So thank you very much. We will open Colombia when we will be big in China. So you need to be extraordinarily explicit uh, on your uh, principles. Your for us, we have a very clear uh, uh, finance 
traject economic trajectory. Very simple, four things, well, not four, let's say four. Uh, uh, we, we want, the minimum will be we will grow twice the market. The market is growing at 5%, we're going at 10, minimum. Uh, uh, we will uh, grow our uh, earning per share by a minimum of 15 to 20 percent year on year. Uh, we, we have no debt. Uh, we set the guideline for the cash. So we have very clear principle and the margin expansion to cover our investments. And, our, and, and we have a finance strategy we explain to the investors on the way we're going to return cash to shareholders in terms of share buyback, in terms of dividend, and in terms of m and All of this is extraordinarily codified. So, then you can let go. But, I mean, you're giving a lot of possibility of people in a very tight <laughs> framework. Again, uh, otherwise it's a, it's a mess. Your human capital strategy should be very clear, especially now. I mean, we have 70,000 people in India, it's not by chance, it's because we explicitly uh, said, you know, we're going to, uh, for the mix of the workforce, for the talent management, because you have more engineers in India and other people elsewhere, uh, we define a human capital strategy where we will have people, how many and, 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 and when, competitiveness and, and other things. And of course, finally, I would put the, uh, the extended company, which is a concept which is very important. Uh, no company in the world, and again, this is very true for PNG, no company in the world could be successful on its own without leveraging an ecosystem of partners, which is making the whole game even more complex. Because you, I mean, the co-petition is something, uh, but again, sometimes it's happening. So we talked about co-petition, I remember years ago, maybe 10 years ago, you cooperate and you compete, you compete and you cooperate. Now we, you are in the world when you want to operate in such scale. We have, for us, we, we are cooperating with SAP, you probably know the SAP uh, software, and we're competing against SAP. Uh, so we have partners such as Cisco, Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, VMC, EMware, that kind of company where we, IBM, we compete and we partner. And, and, uh, but you need all those capabilities. If you took to talk to PNG, so for PNG to be successful, they have identified a, a, a number of partners that we need to cooperate. That's our strategy. How are we going to leverage your capabilities because we can't do things on, on, on your own. So at the end of the day, so those are some, uh, I would say, uh, business principles. And uh, I put a couple of things on, you know, what it, I mean, what it takes to be a CEO. What are the kind of things a CEO should, uh, should have? And I put, you know, four uh, I think which are uh, 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 for me important. I mean, the first one, as you can't manage the beast every day and put your hand up, if you like to manage things, you're dead. Because when you're managing China, you're not in Brazil. When you're managing Brazil, uh, you're, you're, you're not launching South Korea. So you can't, you just can't. So it's all about inspiring. The only thing you could do is inspiring. And in, in this inspiring chapter, I would put having a clear vision and simple, because this is what people want at the end of the day. Tell me where we're going, and then we will figure out, but give me the direction. You need to be authentic. People need to feel that's you. <laughs> so w when they're listening to you, they're not listening to, uh, you're not an actor. <laughs> you're not playing the CEO and you're someone else. So authentic leadership is key. You need to, to be a role model especially when you're a CEO of a large organization. I mean, you're, you're, this is something I learned, you're permanently watched you're, by your people, by the journalists, by the market, by Greenpeace, by whoever, <laughs> NGOs, uh, Alta Mondialist. I mean, everybody's watching you. Uh, and, and, and so is the detect a defect? Uh, it's a problem. I have tons of defect, but some are less visible than others. Uh, and you, leave, you need to leave your corporate values. Important and not leaving uh, the values yourself. So that's the in, inspire thing. The second is the drive. You need to drive, not to manage, to drive, to lead. This is what people expect. They expect you to on the front line, not to orchestrate uh, from your office. 
That's why it's good to have no place to be and no headquarter. That's because I will be at the headquarter organizing meeting with my direct report and we will have meetings on meetings. We don't have any headquarter, we are not in the same place, we can't have meetings. So everybody's moving and we have our physical meeting, we decide where it's going to be. So why don't we go to uh, Brazil? Okay, let's go to Brazil and figure out Brazil. So uh, you need to lead, you need to be decisive. That's something which is extraordinarily important. Uh, the CEO is the one who at the end of the day is making the toughest decision. Not the easy one, but the toughest. And people will look at you whether you're able to make and it's not so much whether the decision is going to be good or bad, it's to decide. And then you, hopefully you would expect that the probability will work for you on, on the good and bad. Uh, it's all the strategic thinking, so you need to be at ease with this complexity VUCA thing. And taking calculated risk, which is important for the board, I will be with the board in two sort of thing, drive, deliver value. But at the end of the day, uh, when I was in, appointed by the, by the board, uh, they interviewed me, blah, 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 and before, uh, say, do you have any question for you, Pierre, to the board? Say, yeah, what do you expect from me? What would be your kind of two or three priorities? And, and one of the board members said, don't screw up. <laughs> that was the only kind of recommendation. But I think it's profound and it's telling exactly what, what that means. At the end of the day, people expect you to lead, to drive, to change, to do the thing, but take calculated risk. Uh, is, is absolutely key because you can, I mean, look at the, and again, uh, I'm not bashing anything or whatever. Look at what happened with HP. I mean, it's very telling on, you know, when a set of challenges could get you in, in, a, in a difficult position. Three, being reliable as a CEO. And on this, I would put uh, trust, seamless execution, telling the truth. Uh, it's interesting to see that in a recent survey I've seen uh, recently, it was a survey on who do you trust? I know whether you've been through that. It's a very interesting one if you could find. So from the journalist, journalist, the media, the NGOs, your mother, your father, your brother, your friend, your whatever, your wife, and the CEO of a company. Who was at the bottom of the list? So it is disappointing. <laughs> which is now post-crisis, it was not vibrant before the crisis, but before the crisis, the CEO would put it in the top five. After the crisis, the CEO was at the bottom of the list as we, we don't trust anymore a CEO in what he's saying. You imagine that? It's, no. it's a problem when you're driving a big organization. Uh, you're communicating to your people, to the analysts, to the investors, to the board, and someone who says, no, I don't trust you, Pierre, at all. But that, that would be a, a big problem. So trust is key. Telling the truth is key, even when you have a problem. Now, the, 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 the name of the game is to, uh, is to tell the truth. Uh, and, uh, and that's why you will see more and more companies asking third parties, working with third parties, NGOs, and so forth. So today, you can't claim you have a good corporate citizenship thing. People will call that, okay, you're doing greenwashing or you try to look good. If you want to be credible, you will need to partner with an NGO who will, to some extent, bring that credibility to you and say, no, we work with Accenture and we can confirm that indeed uh, they walk the talk. Uh, and finally, you need to be relevant. And that's probably uh, why this global MBA is all about. Uh, uh, and relevant means you need to be informed, you need to be open, you need to be global, and you need to learn, 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 and learn. Uh, especially in the current environment, so that's something I'm doing a lot. I'm, I'm reading, I'm talking to people, I'm in different forums of other CEOs, I'm in the professional organization. I, I was in the Commission Atali or on the, for, for, under the, our current uh, thing, so I'm trying to do all the things to stay relevant. And to stay relevant, I'm traveling the world. So if you want to be relevant and understand China, you need to be in China. You need to go in India. You need to talk to the South Korean. And being relevant is what you're doing here. And, uh, and that's extremely important. Inspiring, a driver, reliable, and relevant. That's it.
I know whether you have time, but of course I can take uh, some questions. I, I received a few. Maybe I covered some. In. Um, I just wanted to know what are the motivations that drove uh, to rebrand from um, Anderson Consulting? Yep. And uh, <laughs> what did that impact uh, have an impact on the company? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the reason is we had no choice, which sometimes is the best motivation to do something is when you have no other option. It's it's the best driver, to be honest. Uh, we have no option because uh, you know we we had the arbitration for those who uh, you remember Arthur Anderson, Anderson Consulting in eighty eight nine uh, one nine eight eight. Uh, that was the split between the audit and the consulting, so long ago. And in '88, Anderson Consulting was created with only the consulting, and Arthur Anderson was doing only the audit. The partners from consulting owning the consulting, the partners uh, from audit owning the audit. Then we moved like this till uh, uh, '99, and '99 uh, we decided that for all sorts of reasons we should split because the interests were not the same, except that in our uh, bylaws and things. There was one thing that was never been planned was how, you, how we split. And the split was would requiring two thirds majority on either side. And of course, all the governance was 50 50. So we couldn't get to any resolution because on all the questions it was 50 50. Uh, so we decided to ask for an arbitration. Uh, in Paris, because that was you know, the kind of small uh, letters, and uh, it was without appeal, so it was a, a, a massive bet, and one judge uh, from Colombia, a professor from Colombia, we cherish since th that time, who, had, who, who would decide on the future of, of Anderson Consulting without any appeal on his own judgment. So he's been trying. He'd been, working the case, I think the case now is at many business schools, uh, because it was the biggest arbitration ever. Uh, our, our friends they say, okay, if you want to split, uh, you need to pay tw uh, two times your revenues. Yeah. So billions. And, and we couldn't afford that. And uh, the judge decided that we were already separated to some extent, so we could split without damage, any damages except that you can't reuse the name. That was the only thing. You can't use Anderson, you can't use Arthur, uh, and, uh, and Arthur and Anderson in any form. So we can't, you can't call you uh, Arthur Consulting or uh, whatever. And we had uh, literally a few days to uh, invent a new name. Uh, I think 70 days uh, to, to uh, invent a new name. And uh, it was born with one of our members who invented Accenture, Accent on the Future. That, that what that means, Accenture, Accent on the Future. Uh, and uh, we, we had literally a uh, uh, few, I mean, I, I don't know how many days, but uh, da da da, we have 147 days because now it's a case in the business school as well, uh, from start to finish to rebrand uh, a company uh, at, the, at the size of 100,000 people with a name that didn't exist uh, uh, at all. And we had to find and launch a new name in 47 countries at the same time. Uh, 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 and uh, with no negative meaning in 200 different languages. I mean, you can imagine what that is. Uh, for those who are doing marketing, uh, uh, that, that would be uh, exciting. Uh, and, and so we launched the effort. We invested for the kind of one-time campaign, give a number. Who's, who's working for marketing? 100. Short. But not, not, not that short. 175. One-time campaign all around the world, $175 million to establish Accenture. After two years, Accenture was branded with Interbrand, for those who know Interbrand, in the top 50 
most valuable brand in the world. We never left since that time. So, so Mike, I'm just wondering how often you meet with other CEOs and how big your groups are and from what industries they come from. Yeah, uh, things to that. Yeah, no, 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 sure, sure, sure. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, if I'm organizing my my work in 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 three buckets, if you will. Uh, so one would be, let's say, the board and the investors. So selling Accenture, I'm not selling to the board, but making the board comfortable and selling Accenture to the investors because we are listed and they need to you know, invest uh, in Accenture. Another third is about leading Accenture. So it's uh, leading our governance, uh, shaping the strategy, no, 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 no. And the rest is meeting with our people and meeting with our clients. And uh, traveling the, so I'm, I'm, I'm traveling the world, uh, I'm in Europe one, one week a month, so I would be three weeks somewhere in the world, uh, meeting with clients and CEOs, uh, and meeting our people, doing the, I mean, with clients is representing Accenture, supporting sales, and listening to them. So again, being informed and understanding what's, what's going on. And with our people, it's more on the inspire, create excitement, and, and the American, they love that. I don't know how many of you are coming from the US. You, so you probably, you love the show, probably. Maybe. I'm sure. <laughs> they, they all love, love that. Is there a secret CEO club that you belong to? No, 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 no. No, at least is there is a secret club. I don't know the secret. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I don't, we are participating to many forums uh, from Davos. <laughs> it's not secret. <laughs> it's a, so Davos, I was uh, two weeks ago in a club called the G100. Uh, not because it's secret, they just put 100 CEOs. <laughs> and so we are, we are, uh, uh, I belong to the, uh, to the MEDEF, for those who are French, which is the French uh, employer organization, I'm a member of the board. Uh, I was the uh, chairman of the French uh, consulting and IT association for 10 years. Uh, I, I, I'm participating to the transatlantic advisory board, which is uh, ruling or trying to manage the trade between uh, US and Europe. Uh, I'm in the Singapore Board uh, of Development. I'm in the South Korea Advisory Board for something. Do you find it very useful to, to talk to the CEO? Sure. Do, are they willing to really share their secret sauce techniques? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, more than ever for exactly the... Because what's interesting now is nobody's got the clue. So everybody is trying to, I mean, you've been in China, tell me. <laughs> uh, uh, how are you managing this decentralization while keeping the control of the machine? And so everybody's talking about what I mentioned, because those are the, we understand the principle. Again, uh, management is more today an art than a science. So we believe that for you it's been a science and you play by the book. Now it's more uh, an art. So you need to find the best artist. And uh, uh, you know, I'm very impressed with the Bob McDonald in PNG. Uh, uh, and I will be very impressed with uh, 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 someone starting a startup. So you need to take experience from people running things like you, the giant beast, because there are some protocol with the beast. Uh, and you need as well to remain nimble and to hear from people driving smaller business with agility and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm personally learning a lot uh, from the other CEOs. I'm a young CEO. I mean, I'm young anyway. But <laughs> I'm a very young CEO. <laughs> uh, since you work in Accenture for 29 years, so I believe you were promoted to CEO step by step. So during, uh, which uh, step is crucial in your opinion and why? And uh, any suggestion to us? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, f I mean, frankly, I, I, I didn't plan my, I mean, first, maybe my recommendation, is I didn't plan anything. So I don't think there is a kind of deliberate, you know, I want to be the CEO of Accenture 29 years ago. Uh, I probably starting to figure out 
uh, the day before the board. Uh, and I was pretty, not confident, but I was the only candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I'm starting to feel good. <laughs> at, at least lack of competition at that time. We were three, and then I was the only one invited to the board. So mm, I'm starting to feel something good <laughs> about this. But uh, no, I think there are some milestones. For me, I started in Lyon, my town, small town. So you, we were, I was number 15 in that office when I started. And I feel what the kind of uh, critical milestone was, uh, for me, a mentor, a coach, someone who is taking care of you. And there is always someone, you know, you're not getting this only by processes. Some, you will have people, uh, and for me, I had three in 29 years. Three coach, one in Lyon brought me to leadership in France being you know, a leader in my country. Then another one brought me to the uh, Europe and the world in financial services. So I become you know, famous this. That was my second coach. So the first one was something like uh, seven years. The second one was seven years. And then the last one was the CEO, become my coach. And he asked me in 06 to join the management committee and my job was to reorganize Accenture, so the beast, and to reorganize. So he asked me to do something pretty big. Uh, then I took the responsibility of financial services post subprime. So what I'm getting is some people know better than you if you got it. And when those people you trust, you really trust, ask you to get out of your comfort zone and you, to take more risk, don't think too much uh, and say yes first. I think if I, if I had sought more, I would not be the CEO. So sometimes you just need to trust people who, who see through you, in you, and, and they see they did. is what, what, what happened with me. Of course, I, I was, you know, I made partner in 10 years, which was reasonably quick in 93. So I was always the kind of uh, like a good uh, ESSEC uh, uh, alumni. Well, I have two questions. The first thing is you mentioned scenario planning. So do you have a dedicated team within uh, Accenture that carries out scenario planning? And the second question is related to your global strategy and business development. So does it take place at the top level or it's again within the verticals and it depends on the businesses? Yeah, uh, all of the above. Uh, uh, for us, all the scenario planning is in the combination of the, we have a, a, an organization called Growth and Strategy, so we have a Chief Strategy Officer and he's in charge of, or is working with me on the strategy, and then we have all the finance machine. And when you're a listed company with all the protocol and the gap and the whole thing, you know, it's a, it's a big machine. So those uh, two machines are joining forces uh, to do uh, scenario planning. And, and we are doing that, when, uh, as we speak, we're doing our three years planning. So we're doing the scenario planning for the three years. Now, given what happened with the uh, crisis, we have now <laughs> the project Black Oak. They love that in the US. So, uh, <laughs> tell me more. To, 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 so I know I can't tell anything <laughs> regarding Black Oak by construction. It's, uh, but it's all about all the scenario we, we, we're doing around what might be the worst case, the best case. What, what, what do you mean they love it more in the US versus <laughs> other places? Because, no, you like to use those names, code, and things. So uh, uh, it's, it's Project Black Oak, which is, the, the, which is in, in French, would be scenario planning. <laughs> <laughs> so buy the book in the US. No, where, where are we with Black Oak? So what do you mean by Black Oak? The scenario planning thing. Okay. So yes. <laughs> Making more fun, more uh, a, little a little flavor, and then uh, uh, you're doing the. Uh, uh, now we're doing that on a quarterly basis, given what's happening in the marketplace. So, uh, uh, and we have the machine. So we have the parameters. We know what we are stress testing, and we have different parameters. It's, for us, it's going to be it's easy. GU. So we're going to stress test some GU. What's happening in Europe? 
uh, industry, what's happening in FS is collapsing, for instance, uh, or it might be around some of our businesses. What's happening in the consulting is drying because nobody is buying consulting, but what's happening if the outsourcing is vibrant, the margin are not the same. So then you put that in the machine and that's going to tell you the impact on the growth, the impact on the gross margin, the impact on the OI, the impact on the TRS, the impact on the, you know, on my age and, you know, the health of my daughter. So we have everything in it. <laughs> I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what has been driving you to work at the same place for the last 29 years and still drives you? Yeah. That's one. The second, what is the most challenging situation you've ever faced? in your professional career and how did you manage it? Yeah. Uh, on uh, yeah, but let, let, I will start with the second because this one is, is I mean, what's probably the tough decisions when that's when life is good, when growth is there, when you're investing, when you're recruiting people, it's, it's just perfect. For, for us, what has been the most difficult is to uh, in 07, when we have to decide on, uh, on restructuring Accenture in a very significant way. And, uh, and for us, restructuring the firm is restructuring the people. I mean, that, 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 that's what that is. So probably is when we declare uh, our first ever restructuring charge. We never had any restructuring charge in Accenture. Now, we've been lucky enough. Some companies are going through all, all of this. And uh, so we declare to the market that we have to launch the project fit. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, uh, and that was very hard. Uh, because, you, I mean, we, we, we cut the UK by a third, the US by 40% in two months. So when you have to orchestrate that, uh, explain to the people that, you know, it's good, of course, but even if you're treating the people well. Uh, 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 but when you, you have to go for it and to explain and not apologize, because it's even that what you're doing is the right thing to do for your company. We're going to do the right way. You're absolutely convinced. I mean, you need, even if it's hard for you, you always need to be extraordinarily convinced, straight, yeah, you, you can't blink. That, that, that's what people would expect from you. And if someone you feel is going to hurt Accenture, we feel that's the right thing to do. And let me explain why. And we'll have to do that because we will be stronger ever. And, 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 and we move on. So that, was, that decision uh, was uh, the toughest. Did you sleep well at that time? <laughs> As in, uh, take tough decisions, obviously, the stress, the pressure. Yes, which might be, uh, uh, biz I mean, bizarre in the sense that bigger the organization is, I mean, the, it's, it's more difficult if you're running a company of 10 people and you need to tell three, oh, here, imagine that's the company. Say, 40% going to leave. And it's going to be you, you, and you. Because we are a no-tie company. <laughs> That's the only reason. So, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, when you're driving 250,000 and say we're going to you know, make redundant 15,000 people in the US, it's, it's different. So I don't feel you feel better, but it's less personal than to, to some extent when you when you know the people and you're doing that on, on, on a one by one. So, uh, the first question was? What drives you to, to work every day and for the same company for the last 29 years? Passion. Passion. For? The company. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> 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 tap on the shoulder. <laughs> Say yes. Yes. Yeah, right. That's yes. I mean, that's. Uh, no, I mean, of course, passion for. I mean, I've been the company for 29. I've been through. I mean, that company is very different. I started in Arthur Anderson in the audit. I moved to the consulting. I started in an organization of 15 people in Lyon, one five. And now I'm leading something of 250,000. So the opportunities, uh, and every time. 
I was solicited and I received a couple of offers. You know, every time there was a career move uh, and an Accenture move. So, you know, imagine we were an audit company, we moved to consulting, and from consulting, we moved to technology. From technology, we moved to outsourcing and software. From being US, UK, US Europe, we moved to be now uh, center of gravity elsewhere. I, I don't believe, to some extent, I've got the best of both worlds. I'm, I have the benefit and to some extent uh, the security of being in the same company. So I know the game. I'm probably among the 10 most experienced people now in Accenture. So I, I, know, I, I know the company uh, very well. And, and on the other end, I feel it's, an, it's a new one every five years. So I've, I've, I, I, I do not have the idea that uh, still the same and you're starting to be bored. Uh, but on the other end, I know the company very well, so I feel, you know, reasonably cool. I think last question, and then um, we have a Hi, Pierre. Hi. Hey. My name is Ralph. And, um, hey, Ralph. Really, yes, <laughs> we haven't really been talking too much about um, how a CEO is still able to connect himself with the client and the client's needs at this point. Um, so do you feel that now that you've moved up in the levels of organization in Accenture, do you sort of lose touch with um, what the client's needs are, or uh, are you still very much in touch and you, you, know, you understand very well what the factors are? And if so, what are some of those factors that make a client want to choose Accenture over, let's say, uh, a Deloitte of the world or something sure. like that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, answer, answer to your second question is easy. We're just the best. So it's an easy choice for them. Uh, uh, now, uh, first, the day, and it's my point number four, the day I would feel I'm not relevant from a client standpoint, I, I, first, either I would leave Accenture or probably they would fire me in the first place. Uh, I mean, for a very simple reason, we are a, a service company, a professional services company. So we are... Uh, I mean, we, we, we does exist only because we're serving clients. I mean, the, that, that's different. I mean, in the manufacturing, you're serving clients, but it's different. When you're in the services business, uh, and especially in professional services, I'm relevant because I'm, I'm delivering a service we're going to co-create together. So I'm not manufacturing Thai or whatever, you know. Uh, so we need to understand what the clients want to buy because we, we, we are manufacturing the products with the client. Uh, second, we are extraordinarily client-centric. Many organizations would claim they are client-centric. We are, and that would take more time, maybe another chapter. So what what, what uh, that does mean to be client-centric, really, and starting uh, uh, with the top of the uh, organization. Uh, being relevant is key for your credibility, and your credibility not only with the board, not only with the analyst, but the credibility with your people. I mean, the day I would be irrelevant, even talking about cloud, and one would say in the audience, Pierre, you have no clue. You are irrelevant. You imagine? It's the end of, the, I mean, it's the end of days. So uh, uh, it's an imperative in Accenture to stay relevant. That's why I put that in our top four. And I'm traveling, I'm meeting clients, I'm shaping proposal. Of course, I'm not, and I will not be, you know, really uh, on the edge of the mobility, the cloud, when it's becoming too technical, we have people very good at, but at least you need to get it. And uh, now if you look at, I mean, the big trends outside are very simple. I mean, there are all the trends uh, in, uh, in uh, we can play with the words, I mean, Asian, globalization, consolidation, urbanization, consumerization, uh, 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 innovation. If you look at this, this is what's happening outside. I mean, globalization makes sense. Probably you've been there. Companies, they want to be more global. They buy, they divest, they, whatever they do. Uh, 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 consolidation is the result of the globalization. Uh, giants are getting bigger in order to invest, da 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 da. Uh, consumerization.
in data analytics. Uh, we are in a world of data and we are in a world of a consumer. Everything is consumer driven. So you need to, you know, to understand what this, uh, this market is all about. Innovation, mobility, big data, uh, cloud, uh, analytics. If you look at all of these, all those technology waves are, are coming together. Urbanization, it's a huge uh, trend, especially in emerging markets. So it's driving all the infrastructure world, smart roads, smart cities, smart things, smart shit, whatever. Everything. And uh, uh, so it's all the result of urbanization. No, you, you, no need to. <laughs> I was just writing the larger notes of urbanization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smart, smart infrastructure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that that that's what that that what that is. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>